Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And we're going to continue looking at uh, David H. Steele's paper um, regarding uh, Louis F. Weir and James White. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we invite your presence as we continue to look at the book of Daniel and the principles of, of prophetic interpretation, how we understand uh, literal and spiritual, and how we apply uh, the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation and the rest of the scriptures to the present day. Uh, we ask that you can uh, correct us in any errors we may have in our thinking and to learn from these things as we study together. Uh, be with each person who's looking for truth. May your Holy Spirit reveal to us our need of you, and may you and may we claim your promises and the power that you offer to us through your spirit. That we can live a Christian life. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so so yesterday when we when we were looking at Thiel and Weir, one of the things that we see is this different way of interpreting prophecy. So but we think that that Thiel is in line with Miller. That, that there is, that there's no difference in the rules, the principles of prophetic interpretation that Weir has laid out and those that William Miller has laid out. Thiel believes that Miller has a different system. He, he, he sees them as divergent. Now, we have uh, the idea that modern Israel uh, has no part in Bible prophecy. And we looked at some Ellen White statements that really I mean, I think, make it clear that modern Israel has no part in uh, Bible prophecy. We're not looking to what ha what's happening in the land of Israel as, as fulfilling prophecy in the present time, that all of these things move to spiritual Israel. Now, when we have studied Daniel's last vision, one of the things that we have clearly marked out is that the 2520s connected with the 70 weeks and the 2300 days actually show this. They illustrate that um, at the beginning, when you look at the, for instance, the three decrees that commence the 2300 days, that they're going to be addressing literal Israel coming out of Babylonian captivity. That is the 70 years of Babylonian captivity are going to parallel the 1260 years of papal supremacy so that we can line up a time of the end with 537, 536, as we can with 1798 to 1799, that, that period of time. Um, these things align with each other. So, so the whole, the whole premise that we have in understanding the prophetic periods is based upon the time that we begin with ancient Israel, with literal Israel, and we end with spiritual Israel. So how could we possibly be looking at the actual nations uh, that are, are represented in Daniel chapter 11, such as Edom, Moab, Ammon, taking the king of the south as being Egypt, taking the king of the north as being the land of Syria, does does that make sense to us as Seventh-day Adventists? So when Weir says, because of the Israel imagery so abundantly used in the Revelation, futurists say that it is a book largely pertaining to the literal Jew in Palestine. The prophecies of the apocalypse can be understood only when interpreted in relation to the church, in opposition to that idea. Isn't that absolutely necessary for Adventism to believe? I mean, is this some new interpretation? It, I don't understand Thiel's thinking at all, where he's going to say we need to look at these, you know, Ethiopia and Libya as actually Ethiopia and Libya instead of understanding them symbolically. Any, any comment on that? I mean, I don't see how we can argue with this. Principle three. So let's read this again. This is weird. The things of Israel now belong to the church that the promises to literal Israel, Israel were to be fulfilled in the experiences of the church, 
I was also shown that those who are trying to obey God are God's uh, chosen people, his modern Israel. That's from Second uh, Testimonies 108, 109. The principle that Israel's history is typical or prophetical of the experiences of the church is continually employed in the spirit of prophecy. While Old Testament language is employed in the New Testament when referring to the church, the same phraseology is spiritualized and applied in a worldwide sense. These terms are not preached with the word spiritual or prefaced, pardon me, with the word spiritual because other plain statements clearly state that the church has taken the place of literal, literal Israel. Now, uh, this reminds me of um, an interpretation that sometimes is given to, and I think here, I'm just going to find it. I can never remember where it is. I should be able to find this here quickly. Theodore, yeah, what's the question? Uh, well, uh, I'll have it here in a second. Okay. Yeah, so it's it's James, the book of James, chapter 1, verse 1. And we have a theory that exists within some groups within Christianity. With James, is, he says, James, a servant of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. So when James writes this letter, is he writing lit to the literal 12 tribes, or is he using 12 tribes in a symbolic sense? We're hatting, we're hatting little Israel. Most of them had already um, in a mar- marriage with other countries, so it really wouldn't have been a okay. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't really been a um, been a little twelve tribes, then would it? Right. So, so the the northern northern Israel has been scattered, never to be gathered. Now, now the question is, why does James address the twelve tribes? What what is the thinking there? Why would he be using that expression? Is he writing to literal Israel or is he using this expression to mean something else? And why would he use it? Because there are people who believe that he's writing to the literal 12 tribes. I would think he is writing to the last generation in some way as well. 144,000. Okay, not so as, something not, connected not to the hundred and forty four thousand. Yes. So I know he's writing to the Christians in his time, but in the sense there's a another application to that in, in the sense it's more directly in the sense maybe if it's writing to the last generation and hundred and forty four thousand. Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, that that could be the case. But the one thing I think that we would have to say that James is doing is that he's using this as a symbol, right? That he cannot be be doing this literally. And that, that he understands the typical nature of ancient Israel as it relates even to his day, right? So he's not looking to literal Israel. And to me, the fact that he writes to the 12 tribes, 10 of which really don't exist. I mean, obviously, there are some people here and there who exist in Judah that they can trace themselves back to some of these different tribes. But the idea that then uh, that he's he's actually writing to the literal 12 tribes that are scattered abroad doesn't seem to make sense. Right. That he must be understanding this as a symbol. So he understands that there is, there is in a sense, a gathering time that's happening in his history, that things that have happened in the past are prefiguring things that are happening then, right? Obviously, we can apply it to our time as well. Uh, does that seem to be the, the most parsimonious explanation that he's using it as a symbol? Is there, could we, could we have it that he's not using it as a symbol? Is that even possible? So so some people take statements like this and they say, well, the 12 tribes still exist and they will, you know, they all have uh, some of these tribes become uh, part. There's, um, you know, Herbert W. Armstrong, for instance, British Israelism, where, you know, the tribe of Dan is uh, going to be the Irish 
right? And uh, and he'll take things like uh, um, the word covenant, uh, which is barit, and the word man, which is ish, that that's where the word British comes from. You know, it's a false etymology because that's not where the name British comes from. But he'll say British means covenant man, right? So the British are, you know, part of that covenant of northern Israel. Now, this this stuff has all been disproven. I mean, we don't trace the people of, of Britain uh, to being the northern tribes of Israel or anything like that. But but it was a popular idea when people didn't have a lot of information. It it seemed plausible. But but you can see the problems if we try to use literal Israel and the literal nations of the Bible and apply them in time prophecies or, or prophecy, which is, you know, of today, right? It, to me, this seems Gusef Weir's understanding just seems to be standard it seems to be not something new that lewis f weir came up with it seems to be basically pervasive through adventism right from the beginning even even pervasive in millerite understanding now the question is why did the millerites get caught up in applying some things literal when they should have applied them as figures. So why are they going to be looking at, well, it must be the king of the north, must be Turkey, and the king of the south must be Egypt. Though that's not what Miller's going to do. He's going to have the king of the north is Britain and the king of the south is Spain. But but why did some people get caught up in that? What What's the problem? Why, if they understood this principle that's laid down here by Lewis F. Weir, why would they get caught up in applying things literally? Questioning and rejecting the spirit of prophecy in Illinois. Well, but with the Millerites initially, too, they did they made those same mistakes because what what Smith is presenting in in Daniel chapter 11, verse 36 to 45, is what Josiah Litch taught. So Josiah Litch is also going to make that same error. Mm. Right. I, I, just, I just seem to recall in the 1888 sermons by Ellen White about them doing that. Uh, she mentions, you know, Sister White, when she says this, Sister White is inspired, and when she says this, it's her own thoughts, and she rebukes them for that. Mm-hmm. But anyway, so what, where are you going with that? Well, I'm just saying, what what is it that would make people look at things literally when they when they already understand that they should look at it spiritually? Why would people take the literal nations and apply them? Not not just you know presently, but why did that even happen in Millerite history? To them, it would seem to fit. Okay. Like present- just like present day, you know, the Euphrates River drying up and things happening in the Middle East, people come to that conclusion because it looks like it works. Right. So they're looking at the headlines of today and trying to make uh, sense out of what they see and fit it into Bible prophecy. And if there's something that seems to fit literally, then they take it literally. Right. Because we do understand that some things in the Bible are literal. I mean, the Bible isn't just like completely symbolic, but there are symbols employed and that we we take things literally like the history and so forth as literal, unless there's a reason that we are to understand not to be literal. So there is some some occasions when things are literal. But when we're dealing with end time prophecy, I don't see how we could take any of those nations as literal, that we would have to apply this in a figurative and worldwide sense, right? So to me, this just seems to be the foundation of of Adventism, of the Millerite movement as well, that we have the 70 weeks that has this transition from literal to spiritual. And then we talked about the fact that in the book of Daniel, we have uh, the daily paganism, which is a counterfeit of the earthly, 
and papalism, the abomination of desolation, which is papalism, is a counterfeit of the heavenly. And that is a counterfeit of Christ. This There is this, um, as Stephen said, like sort of like this delay that, you know, Satan has to catch up to in, in his counterfeit of these things. So it, it doesn't make sense to, I mean, obviously we know Babylon is going to be not understood literally. And so Daniel must also move from literal to spiritual. There's, there's doesn't seem to be a reason to say that Daniel must be a literal prophecy all the way through. It just, it can't be, right? It, it can be literal in the beginning because it's dealing with the daily, but once they move to the abomination of desolation, it has to be symbolic. It has to be spiritual. And, and we've seen this in Daniel where uh, the time of the end and, and these other things are, are showing us Millerite history and that they need to be understood as Millerite history as a repeat, as a copy of things that have happened previously. So there's always this repetition that goes on. Okay. Um, so Theo goes on, um, which, which we read, but we're going to read it again. Essentially, this principle gives permission to the reader to spiritualize any part of Daniel 11 that refers to events from the time of the crucifixion of Christ moving on forward. Now, of course, that's not what we say, right? So we don't just count from the crucifixion of Christ in Daniel 11. We're going to we're going to say that the, the counterfeit of that, the parallel to that is the taking away of the daily and the setting up of the abomination of desolation. So we, we, we say in Daniel 11, it's really literal until the papacy. But but generally, we would do that with Bible prophecy, that that literal nations and so forth are symbolic of things at the end of the world that um, that we wouldn't take as literal. Um, so he, uh, Theo is saying, about we are those who don't use this principle of hermeneutics are then labeled as futurists under the influence of a Jesuit fostered, fostered system of interpretation. Now, obviously, he's putting these things in quotes, but he's sort of framing it in such a way that it's meant to... Sh- meant to sort of malign what how we are is 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 looking at this so obviously spiritualize any part of daniel 11 right i mean again he's using the word spiritualize in sort of this negative sense it's like we can just do whatever we want with it and that you know and we are sort of mocking other people as futurists who don't follow his crazy ideas and that they must be Jesuit fostered system of interpretation. Now we know futurism comes from the Jesuits, right? This was part of the counter reformation, both futurism and preterism are, I can't remember the guy's names. I, I used to remember them. Can't think of them right now. The Kunza and uh, what's the other guy's name? Anybody remember the names of these Jesuits who created futurism and preterism? Yeah, so preterism, I, what's that? Uh, pre, uh, preterism is Alcazar. Um, yeah. Uh, futurism, futurism is Rivera. Francisco Rivera. Rivera. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and and the and and the idea of these is preterism is that that all these things are just written in the past. That you know they're not predicting the future. They're just writing contemporaneously with events, making it look like it's prophecy. And then futurism is all of this is just in the future. None of it was meant to be fulfilled in the past. And and that's how people often evangelicals approach the book of Revelation. Everything's in the future. And it's describing usually chronologically, you know, these events that are going to happen in the future. Though they don't always follow the same system. And, and that's usually what you're going to find. So right now, you know, people are looking at, you know, what's happening in Israel and with you know these other countries around them in the Middle East, that this is how the end of the world is going to come about. It's about a conflict in the land of Israel. Now, this uh, unless wholly under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, we will all misinterpret the Bible. And at times, as we have shown, Uriah Smith walked contrary to the light given through the spirit of prophecy. His presentation that Turkey is the king of the north and that Armageddon refers to a military battle in Palestine 
is part of the Jesuit fostered system of interpretation, the counterfeit of the spirit of prophecy teaching concerning the kind of final conflict. So we would agree with him that this is from Ribera, right? Was it Francisco Ribera? Is that the name, Stephen? Is that what you said? Yes. Okay, yeah. Okay, so so this is futurism. Now, is is we are just name calling here? Is he trying to create bias by this? I I don't think so. I think he's just really stating the fact. When Armageddon is a military battle in Palestine, this is something that is not part of our understanding as Seventh day Adventists. So that means that that Theo must believe that it is. Anyway. What we are attempting to do is make Smith appear to be a futurist. And that's actually not what he's doing. He's just saying that he's influenced by this, by the literal aspects of futurism. But anyway, if he can make the allegation stick, then the effect is that Smith must have fallen under the influence of the Jesuit fostered system of interpretation that would result in one becoming either a preterist, where all prophecies were fulfilled in the past by reckoning literal Israel, and not a year for a day, or a futurist because both originated with Jesuit priests attempting to vindicate the Pope while misdirecting Protestant charges of the Pope being the Antichrist. Now, I don't think that I see here that um, that this is what Weir is doing. So you, you can see here that Thiel is actually gaslighting, Correct. He's, he's accusing Weir of using the tactics that he himself is using. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, it, 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 to me, it's very clear that that's what he's doing. So he's putting words in the mouth of Weir. He's picking and choosing what he wants to use so that he can discredit without actually dealing with the argument. Because one thing he's not doing is making a case here uh, for his interpretation. That is, it's not even clear what Thiel believes regarding Armageddon, right? He hasn't. I mean, is he taking the position that it is a military battle in Palestine? He hasn't really stated this directly, right? So, so I'm not really sure what he thinks. Okay, so he says, but to make Smith a futurist, Weir has to first redefine futurism because the genuine futurist doesn't believe in the sanctuary doctrine or in that, or that the time prophecies of Daniel are all confined within the 2300 day year period. Now, again, I don't think that Smith is trying to make, uh, or Smith, Weir is trying to make Smith appear a futurist. He's just saying that he's adopting some of these ideas that happen from in futurism that is applying things literally. So I don't think he would go so far to say that Smith is a futurist or that we should think of him as a futurist, right? Because obviously we know Smith is going to believe in the time prophecies and, and so forth in Millerite history and that, right? So so I think that this is, is gaslighting and a misdirection. Uh, the genuine futurist cuts off the seven years at the end of the 490 day year period and places it at the very end of time, not to be confused with the time of the end, which is the end of time prophecies found in Daniel, which they then designate as the time of tribulation, which God's people escape by the secret rapture. But those who are not raptured get a second probation. However, if Weir succeeds in making your eye Smith a futurist, then they there are entangling unintended consequences, right? So obviously we know that Weir isn't doing this. He's not claiming that Smith is a futurist. He doesn't even say that. He's just saying that he's influenced or he's under the influence of the Jesuits in, in, or it's an interpretation that comes from an influence of the Jesuits, right? So to look at these things literally would make no sense. So you can see how Thiel is framing this, this argument, how he's trying to tear down Weir without really addressing the actual scriptures and, and trying to study it out. Consistently applying Weir's reasons for why Smith is a futurist, which of course Weir doesn't say, and consequently under the influence of the Jesuits. Now, 
it's an in a Jesuit influenced interpretation. Now, you know, obviously, all of us have influences of all kinds, but he's stating it way, way stronger uh, than Weir is. We would have to conclude that Adam Clark was under Jesuit influence for suggesting that Turkey would literally be furious over news from Russia and Persia since he predicted a future event in 1825, which was fulfilled in 1853, 21 years after his death in 1832. Now, remember, Adam Clark had made this prediction, we'll say, that uh, 21 years or 25 years, mm, what is that? I can't remember how many years, 30. Um, yeah, so he made the prediction in 1825. Uh, so it's going to be 28 years later, right? Now, one thing that Thiel never addresses is the prediction that we're made regarding the fall of the Soviet Union. He actually tries to, he doesn't even address it. He, he never addresses Weir's prediction that came true. So he's going to focus on Adam Clark's. Now, the fact that, you know, we had these events that were sort of predicted by Adam Clark, would we say that that is a remarkable, remarkable fulfillment of prophecy, that he got that right? That we then say, well, because Adam Clark got something right in his under, literal understanding of Daniel chapter 11, then we need to accept that as a fulfillment of prophecy. Russia and Persia, that is, tidings out of the north and out of the east shall trouble him. Right? This, this, is, this is the thing that he focuses upon. How do we address that? Can we take, uh, when, when somebody makes a prediction, do we have to accept that their interpretation is correct just because it occurs? Well, what comes to mind? And if if a if they're not 100% correct, then they're a false prophet. If they say it, something that doesn't come to pass or a false prophet, if they say, but they got to be 100%. Okay. Not, but but not hit, people not can make predictions. Miss. People can make predictions that come true. Doesn't mean they're and, a prophet. No. And typically there's other, other ones that they make that don't come true. So that's what I'm saying. You know, they, some they get right, some they get wrong. Yeah. So, so people get some things right, some things wrong. So he's focusing upon this one thing, right? Which, which he then is going to say that we, we need to accept this interpretation because we had a fulfillment. Now, we also have a fulfillment that we're had, which of course, he, again, he's not going to address that. It's not going to address 1989 and what happened with the United States and the Soviet Union, that basically Weir was correct. So, so he doesn't address that. He doesn't try to address that problem. Now, if we look at uh, this dealing with the Eastern question, uh, I'm trying to find this quote by Clark. I know it's in the paper, but I want to find it somewhere else. Okay, so in Daniel 11, verse 44, Adam Clark, uh, it's his commentary, so I'm just going to get this here. I'll get it set up. Okay, so Adam Clark says, uh, I didn't share that properly. I don't know what happened there. Okay, there we go. The tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. This part of the prophecy is allowed to, to be yet unfulfilled. And what is portended? The course of prophetic events will show. Here we are to understand as it applies to Antiochus. Were we to understand that it applies to Antiochus, right? So Adam Clark is saying it doesn't. Then the news might be of the preparations which he heard, that the provinces of the east and Artaxerxes, king of Armenia, on the north were intending to rise up against him. But if the Turkish power be understood, as in the preceding verses, it may mean that the Persians on the east and the east and the Russians on the north will at some time greatly embarrass the Ottoman government. And how completely has this been fulfilled first by the total destruction of the Egyptian fleet by the combined fleets of England, France and Russia in the Bay of Navarino. And secondly, by the total overthrow of the Turkish army by the Russians in the years 1828 and 1829 when the sultan was obliged to accept any conditions that the emperor of Russia was pleased to give. So Adam Clark, when he 
when he writes this, is he looking now, it says the former part of the note was written for the first edition of this work printed in 1825. Okay. So we can see that first he wrote about this, but this is a later edition. So Adam Clark is looking at events that happened in 1828 and 1829 as being a fulfillment. Correct? Right? So he's talking about how this was fulfilled He's not making a prediction about what's going to happen in the future. Does that make sense? That's safe. That's the way I understand. Okay. Now, Thiel is going to, and Smith, is going to apply this to 1853. But Adam Clark himself has applied it to 1828 and 1829. Can you see how Thiel is overstating his case? That there are, there is lots of people in, in in studying biblical chronology, I've dealt with all kinds of chronological schemes and all kinds of prophetic interpretations. So we will see people finding fulfillments of prophecy in all kinds of events. So the fact that people later took what Adam Clark said and said, well, no, we actually are going to fulfill this, not in 1828 and 1829. We're going to find a fulfillment in 1853 shows that this is not a very solid interpretation of this prophecy. That you can find ways to fulfill prophecies when you just cherry pick events. How does how does James White put that again? Regarding looking at uh regarding interpreting prophecy based on it being fulfilled uh I forget now. It's like I forget how he says it. To interpret it based on looking back, we can see how it was fulfilled. So that prophecy is a uh, evidence of God that can tell the end from the beginning. It's not. Yeah. Yeah. N now, the thing about, you know, this movement. So we, we made some predictions um, in the past. Right. And, and predictions connected with time. Now, now, when we first had made, you know, time setting, we'll call it what, what we call time setting, which, which I don't think was time setting, but uh, maybe it was for some people in the way that they were doing it. But we were measuring the time. And, and so a date was set, November 9th, 2019. And that was uh, first introduced to the movement on October 3rd, 2018. So, um, Shortly after that, Heidi and I were studying, and Heidi came on Ellen White's uh, Civil War visions. And as we looked into these these visions, and we, we looked at the structure of her visions, um, we started to recognize that there was a structure connected with the Civil War in the United States in the 1860s with the Civil War that went on in Millerite, or not Millerite, in, in ancient Israel history, right? So that connected the division of the kingdom of, of Israel into north and south, and then the civil war that went on. These parall paralleled the, um, the American Revolution and the civil war in 1863, or 1860s, right? So that there was this, this, we could look at ancient Israel and we could compare it to our history. And then we could connect it to, to, to Millerite history and, and early Adventist history. And then we could connect it to our history. And so we had this prediction regarding the thanks. It's called the Thanksgiving Day pr prediction, November 22nd, uh, 2018. We, we made this prediction a couple of days before. Now, a year later, Jeff examined our prediction and and he agreed with the structure of it he says well we already know these things but he had a different interpretation of how it was fulfilled than i had and and part of my 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 argument or the reason why i believe that we were given this thanksgiving day prediction was to show that we could not predict events in the future and that even after the passing of a date, the interpretation of an event was not always clear. 
That is, people can sometimes think when they're watching the headlines that they see a fulfillment of prophecy. And so it's not always clear. Now, we need to have something that's going to help it be clear. So, you know, we can't just say, I made a prediction and it turned out correct so that everything else I say in connection with that must be correct or that I followed everything correctly, right? There, There is, it's more involved. And, and, and so we can see here that what Thiel is trying to argue from Adam Clark is actually very weak. There is a way that there is a way that there is a way that seemeth right unto the man, and that seems to apply to the idea of that interpreting prophecy by the headlines. Yeah. So when I look at Thiel, he he puts so much weight upon Adam Clark predicting this event, which Adam Clark doesn't predict, and he actually sees it as fulfilled, not in 1853. But in 1828 and 1829, a few years before he dies, yet we have Lewis F. Weir's prediction that is much more solid and tied with all all kinds of other ways tied together and shown to be true that that he's not going to address. Right. So he's going to pick what he considers to be his main line of evidence is that. Adam Clark was correct. And so, but, but that's a faulty argument. I didn't get the whole, I didn't get the whole line of thinking there. I was busy with some things, but, uh, so this 18 or Adam Clark was correct in what year being fulfilled? Okay. So Adam Clark in 1825 wrote his commentary. Now he's okay. going to update the commentary later and then he's going to have the fulfillment of Daniel 11, verse 44, that tidings out of the east and the north shall trouble him, right? Mm -hmm. He's going to taste that, and um, he's going to say that was fulfilled in 1828 and 1829. By Turkey and Israel? Who are the players that that were fulfilled? Fulfilled. Well, Turkey is going to be be troubled by tidings out of the east and out of the north, right? Now, so, so that contrasts or whatever with Josiah Lich. What do we do with him? No, no, uh, we're not August dealing with Josiah. No, well, we're not dealing with that. Um, no, but he didn't either. Apparently, right? Yeah, David, so... David Thiel? Okay, so let's deal with just this first one. So the first one is that he's saying that Adam Clark predicted what happened in 1853, yet Adam Clark applies it to 1828 and 1829 as being fulfilled. But he's not okay. telling Phil is not telling you that, that Adam Clark actually didn't predict 1853. He predicted 1828 and 1829 according to his own understanding. Okay. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Slight, so so he's using hand. Yeah. So yeah. So he's saying that well Adam Clark was then under Jesuit influence, right? Well well in a sense, I mean Lots of us are under Jesuit influence in all kinds of ways. But, you know, he, he's overstating his argument. He's misrepresenting. It. He says, also, we would have to conclude that Josiah Lich was under Jesuit influence for predicting that the Ottoman power was virtually ended in August 11th, 1840, because he also taught that Turkey was the king of the north. No, Right. Just because Josiah Lich taught that the autumn, that Turkey was the king of the north would have no effect on his understanding of Revelation chapter 9, correct? I don't know enough to comment on that. Well, well there's, no connection between, there's no connection between how he interpreted Revelation chapter 9 and getting August 11th, 1840, between his belief b- regarding Daniel chapter 11, verse... 36 to 45. There's there's no interpretive connection. There's nothing about these things that are connected. Yeah, but no. what he's saying is that yeah, since Josiah Lich was wrong about one thing, he must be wrong about another. What's that? In Louis Weir's writings, there's he doesn't connect those two. Is that what you're saying? Louis Weir? 
I'm saying Josiah Litch doesn't connect those two things. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, so Theo's arguing because if somebody's wrong about something that's unconnected to something else he believes, does that discredit what else he believes? Baby in bathwater. But yeah, I guess sort of. But it it they're just not connected. So. He's just saying, well, if Josiah Litch was under Jesuit influence because he was wrong about Turkey being the king of the north, then he must have been wrong about August 11th, 1840. But that doesn't follow. Is this because, a Jesuit? Is this something that Jesuits use as a distraction from the true interpretation? Well, Jesuits the used, yeah, the Jesuit futurism. So, futurism. so what Neil is doing is he's he's totally misrepresenting the whole case. Right. First, he's he's claiming that Lewis F. Weir is saying that um, uh, Uriah Smith is a futurist, which, of course, Weir is not saying. He's just saying that there is influence in the understanding of Smith, which comes from the Jesuits. And the way that it comes from the Jesuits is that that Jesuit influence has influenced Protestant interpretation, right? That there are things that Protestants believe about Bible prophecy that are wrong. And, and that comes from the Jesuits, these ideas. You would never have looked at it this way if it wasn't for futurism. Now, it doesn't mean that he's a futurist, but there's an influence, an unconscious influence that sort of pervades biblical interpretation, even in the time of William Miller, right? We, we can actually trace it. We can go back and trace gradually how this influence of both preterism, which preterism would uh, make Atticus um, Epiphanes the fulfillment of that history. And, and futurism would see it having to do with a literal Israel, right? Because it's talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I follow, I follow that. Yeah. yeah. So, so that influence is there. It's an influence of the Jesuits. It doesn't make somebody a futurist just because they have some of those elements influencing their interpretation. So Weir is not calling Smith the futurist. He's just saying he's influenced through the things that he has studied to come to an interpretation that would be inconsistent with the scriptures. So to have Turkey be the king of the north at that time would be inconsistent. That's all. It's just an influence. Mm -hmm. So so then what Theo argues is he says, well, if, you know, if um, Smith was a futurist, then Adam Clark was a futurist, too. Right. When he made this prediction. But he didn't make that prediction. Right. He didn't predict 1853. He predicted 1828 and 1829. So in 1825, he publishes it. But later on, he edits it when he sees a fulfillment in 1828 and 1829 of what he had described as tidings out of the east and the north shall trouble him. Now, Theo's not going to tell you that. Right? He's not going to tell you that Adam Clark actually had a different fulfillment than Smith had. He's just, he, he's going to do some sleight of hand here. He's going to also ignore that Lewis F. Weir made a prediction which is much more solid and has many more lines of evidence regarding the fall of the Soviet Union. But he's not going to tell you about that. He's not going to tell you about Weir's prediction of the fall of the Soviet Union. Right. That's one of the things that's also telling when somebody discredits someone, but never really uh, presents what that person taught, but just, you know, picks and chooses to show how this person is wrong, mm -hmm. then you're not allowed to choose for yourself. You're not allowed to to look at the information. You know, so if he had done an exposition that says, here's what we're predicted, um, and, and it appears to come to pass, but we think he's wrong, and here's why he's wrong, and all these biblical arguments, that would be one thing. But they don't really even tell you what Weir's conclusions are. He's just picking and choosing statements to discredit Weir. An amazing fulfillment, really. Yeah. Well, when it comes to uh, when it comes to Weir predicting what happened with the fall of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, I was there, not in in uh, Germany, but I was studying Weir, and I saw it happen, and I understood it as a fulfillment of prophecy. Now, I didn't recognize it as the time of the end, but I understood Louis F. Weir was right, you know? And, and then we've seen all of this other evidence for 1989, and then the, with the connection with September 11th. It's right? really something how the General Conference didn't recognize or acknowledge it as well. Well, because... It's amazing to me. Well, because it's the fourth generation. Mm -hmm. And they had forgotten. But, but still, it just, it's just... Yeah, well, I know. An amazing uh, blindness. They just had their opportunity. They had their opportunity to see it. All, all that the church saw when the Soviet Union fell was, oh, we have this opportunity for evangelism in Russia. Right. That's right. Right. Yeah. So they weren't really and, uh, looking at the fulfillment of prophecy. Did you uh, consider, no, it wasn't really until 1992 that you had that article in Time magazine that showed that it was a secret alliance that brought down the Soviet Union. So were you saying ships and horses being the United States and the papacy being the king of the north there sort of coming together to accomplish that in USSR? Because that wasn't really revealed until a few years after 1989. Right. Yeah, I mean, I didn't fully understand it right on November 9th, 1989, or November 10th. Right? Stephen, you're, Stephen, you're referring to the Time magazine cover. Was it the Pope and Reagan, the Holy Alliance? No, Days of the World. Yes. Or is it the Holy yes, Alliance? Uh, the Holy Alliance by Carl Bernstein. Okay, what about the Days of the Whirlwind? When is that? That's that's well, shortly after. That was on the 25th of December, 1989, so that was a Newsweek article. Right. Um, yes. Yeah. Now, the thing is, I, I remember, um, I mean, I remember reading Weir and about what was going to happen. Okay, so, so I... But I, I don't think I understood it like right away after it was fulfilled. I mean, I knew when it was when it happened that this was a fulfillment of prophecy and was somehow connected with what I had read in Lewis F. Weir. But I didn't fully understand all of it until, you know, it sort of unfolded afterwards. I have a newspaper clipping actually from back when was it Reagan that was the first to reappoint a political ambassador to the papacy yeah we we looked at that yeah i have a, have the actual clipping mm -hmm. i recognized it mm -hmm. no no yeah it's just pretty neat so so anyway we can take adam clark and we take josiah Lich, and we can see that the argument that theo is making regarding what we are saying it, it doesn't apply um, and here he says, and since Lich also developed the idea of a pre-advent judgment, which is the basis for Seventh-day Adventist understanding of the investigative judgment, one might be tempted to think that such a concept must also be much influenced by Jesuits, as was Lich's futurism. Further, William Miller, whose preaching led Lich to publish on these matters, must also have been influenced by the Jesuit system of interpretation. So this is a logical fallacy, Right. The logical fallacy is that if somebody is wrong in one area, then that means we have to discredit everything else they say. And, and I've seen this. I can't remember what the logical fallacy is called. Um, it's not muddy in the water, but it's related to it. So there are times that people are correct. I mean, I've quoted people who say something extremely well. And so I use a quote. And then somebody will say, but this person also believed this other thing, which was wrong. How can you quote them? And it's like, you know, just because they're right about something doesn't mean that they're right about everything. And just because they're wrong about something doesn't mean they're wrong about everything. That is, we can't find any logical connection between the idea that you're going to take some things as literal that could discredit when they don't do that, 
<laughs> right? That is, it's not the investigative judgment and and all and and William Miller's prophecies aren't based upon taking these things as literal, right? They're actually based upon understanding uh, the typical and the antitypical. So it's just a very bad argument. It's not. It's not. It's it's not a valid argument. Okay. Plus, he's overstating what Weir is saying about Smith. Okay. Uh, the only way that we can begin to navigate through this minefield of accusation is to look at what Lewis Weir wrote when he first published a series of articles exposing the errors of futurists of the futurists. He was sincerely concerned for souls who might be deceived by such a devious interpretation that worked toward a removal of anything that made the papacy out to be the Antichrist. So he began his series of articles with an explanation as why futurism was invented, then continued quoting a series of authors who denounced the genuine article. Satan, however, anticipating uh, the fulfillment of these prophecies, devises false interpretations of them, referring their fulfillment to the future, and thus blind eyes to the messages which God is sending at that particular time. Blind eyes. Once people are, once people are people, there must be a, just a type of, once people are persuaded that these things are future and hence do not directly concern them, they are indifferent to the stirring messages due for their time. Okay, now here he's addressing something completely different. So I, I don't think it's I don't think it's a fair to quote this whole thing. But anyway, it goes on. The Reverend Joseph Tanner, Bachelor of Arts, in his book Daniel and Revelation, gives uh, or pages sixteen to seventeen says, "So great a hold did the conviction that the papacy was the Antichrist gain upon the minds of men that Rome at last saw she must bestir herself and try by putting forth other systems of interpretations to counteract the identification of the papacy with the Antichrist." Accordingly, towards the close of the century of the Reformation, two of the most learned doctors set themselves to the task, right? So this is going to be the Al Alcazar and Rivera, right? So, so we already know about these these guys. So we know that uh, Weir is understanding that si those systems. Let me see here. So I don't know if we need to read all this. I've selected three brief extract, extracts from the commentaries of recognized conservative denominations to illustrate how Protestant churches once held this belief as a fundamental, fund, as a fundamental of Protestantism. Dr. Adam Clark, in his notes on Daniel 7.25, says, He shall speak great words against the Most High, says, To none can this apply so well and so fully as the Pope of Rome. Now here, Weir makes Clark a scholar untainted by the Jesuit system of interpretation, but we have already noted how he unintentionally paints Clark as such. So, again, just because Clark is correct about many things, doesn't mean that he's correct about everything. And doesn't mean he doesn't have some influence in his thinking, right? So this, this whole thing, this whole argument is a really bad argument. Now, Dr. Uh, Dr. H. Grattan Guinness, uh, which he's an interesting guy because he's the one who uh, first calculated the 391 years of Revelation 9 as being a uh, uh, this this period of um, um, this the cycle dealing with the Islamic calendar and so forth, right? This lunar cycle, this natural lunar cycle. I don't know if he connected it to the Islamic calendar. I did that, but you know, he he connected it uh, to to Islam, right? Okay. Um, anyway, so he's gonna, on Romanism and the Reformations, page two fifty to two sixty, has irrefutably shown that futurism came from Rome to oppose the inspired declarations of the reformers that the papacy was the Antichrist. Space will permit but a few extracts from this masterly work. He writes of the Reformation from the first and throughout that movement was energized and guided by the prophetic word. Luther never felt strong and free to war against the papal apostasy till he recognized the Pope um, as the Antichrist. Right. So I don't think we need to read all of this stuff here. 
Um, but anyway, and whose interpretation of prophecy does it justify and approve? That of the Romanists. Romanists. Let this be clearly seen. Rome felt the force of these prophecies and sought to evade it, right? So, so we know all of this, right? This is something we all know. So I don't think it's, uh, we need to read all of that. Okay, so we'll get, so, so we can agree with this background that um, where futurism and, and, and preterism comes from. Just with the evidence, so this is uh, Theo writing again, just with the evidences provided by these articles, the Smith really fit the description of a futurist who helped screen the papacy from detection as the Antichrist. No, and so again, he's putting words into Weir's mouth, right? Weir is never stating this. Are Smith's statements in any way unhistoric futuristic interpretation? Lewis Weir has taken up the same reasoning as James White to make it appear that if one accepts Turkey as the king of the north, then one must be guilty of making Turkey the legs of iron, Turkey the beast with ten horns coming out of the sea, Turkey the wood horn, etc., etc., which in our mind should already be established as absurd. Yes. So obviously that's the reason why he makes this argument that that the final kingdom is Rome, and that to have Turkey be in the final kingdom is inconsistent. Anyway, Weir had quoted Reverend E. Nangle to show the supposition that the words man of sin designate an official succession or class is not an unwarranted assumption. In other words, the Antichrist could be a class or system of which the papal system is first among peers, but would not exclude, exclude any other that behaves with the same modus operandi such as changing God's law or persecuting God's people, as Islam certainly has done. Okay, we should already be in agreement that the interpretations given for those visions in their respective chapters uphold the identities of the players, whether the individual or corporate in nature introduced at those times. It can be no other, but the King of the North is a descriptive a title that is applied consistently by Smith throughout his interpretation as literal throughout. The literal interpretation cannot arrive at the conclusion that the king of the north is the papacy. In order to arrive at that conclusion, we must have, we are, uh, conclusion, we are, in order to arrive at that conclusion, we are, that must contrive that's something wrong with this sentence. Must contrive. Yeah, the, the grammar is not right there. Yeah, a hermeneutical system that allows him to interpret. Must have contrived a hermeneutical system that allows him to interpret prophecy in a figurative, spiritualized, take, mystical method. I think take out it. that after we're. Take yeah. Out that. Yeah, we must contrive a hermeneutical system. Now, now of course. Is that true that in order to have the king of the north as the papacy? Um, I, I mean, it, this, this is a little bit frustrating, <laughs> right? So, so where does this come from? So what we're saying is that there is this figurative, spiritualized, mystical method that Weir has introduced. He's contrived it. It's a new hermeneutics. That's, that's, the, that's basically the thesis of Theo. Right. Now, James White supports this idea that the papacy is the king of the north. Do we have any evidence that James White believed in a figurative, spiritualized or mythical method of hermeneutics that somehow is is anti-Adventist? Now, this next sentence, we are accused of Smith of being a futurist, but he has acted more like a futurist than Smith since he contrived a system that Ellen White did not bring together. We already read how Ellen White had recommended the rules that Miller, William Miller used. Note that Weir wrote in the last of his 1931 series of articles on futurism. And so futurism finds it necessary to do, introduce unheard of things, special rules of interpretations to establish his, its claims. So obviously this is an extremely distorted paper. So is, do we see anything in Weir that contradicts the principles laid out in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy? Not that I can find. Now, he's going to claim that, you know, this is spiritualizing, it's figurative, it's mystical. But I don't find that in Weir. 
I find just solid biblical interpretation. So we're going to have to examine some weir as well. Even though we have a point of contention regarding hermeneutics, the greatest point of contention is whether or not to apply identifications already established in and connected to a different vision by the interpretation supplied in the given chapter of Daniel. Is it proper to force an identified character from one vision given in Daniel 2 or Daniel 7 onto characters presented in Daniel 11 that may or may not have a different delineation of events and which may or may not introduce a different player that also demonstrates similar characteristics of the papacy, but has different qualifications and restraints that are not fully revealed to Daniel and yet are more fully revealed to John in, in the Revelation as they relate to the three woes. So, so what he is saying here is that if we're going to say that Rome is that final kingdom in Daniel 11, he's saying, is that proper to force an identified character from one vision given in Daniel 2 or Daniel 7 onto characters presented in Daniel 11? Now, is that consistent or is it force? So we're, if we're saying in Daniel chapter 11, that it should follow what we see in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. Is, is that consistent with repeat and enlarge? Or is it forcing something upon Daniel 11 that we shouldn't be forcing upon Daniel 11? It's doing okay. damage to the verse. So it's forcing. Okay, so you're saying it's forcing, saying that Daniel 11 is wrong. Rome is the king of the north. No, I'm not saying that. That's wrong. I'm not saying, I mean, Rome is the king of the north. I'm saying that so much of what Theo is doing here is forcing things that are not correct. Yeah, but but he's saying that James White is forcing this interpretation. On no, James, James White's correct and he's wrong. Right. Now, what you can see is he's saying that because they're identified in chapter 2 and 7, we, we shouldn't just assume that in Daniel 11 they're the same. Right. And that and now he's saying he's forcing this upon that is feel is saying that James White is forcing this upon Daniel 11. Right. That, that he needs to be more open. And he's saying, well, the reason why we can do this in Daniel 11 is because what we have in Revelation 9 dealing with Islam. Right. So he's saying that in this repeat and enlarge in Revelation, we have Islam. So we must have the seed of that in Daniel, right? That's that's what he's arguing. That's basically his view, that Revelation chapter 9 has Islam, and so we're going to see Islam in Daniel chapter 11, through Turkey being the king of the north. So he's saying there are similar characteristics between the papacy and Islam. Is that true that there are some characteristics that Islam has and the papacy has, the beast of Revelation has? They're both satanic powers, both connected to the bottomless pit. Is that enough to say that in Daniel chapter 11, we need to see Islam as Turkey as the king of the north? No. Okay. So now he's saying because there are similar characteristics to the man of sin in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is not a reason to take the description of this king the king that shall do according to his will. Now, remember, that's going to be France, not Islam, right? So I'm having a hard time understanding how he's he, he's he's seen his his arguments. He hasn't gone through uh, a verse by verse study of these to show his view or his opinion. Um, now, of course, we have Uriah Smith's understanding. So we know that he's he's got some of that. But Uriah Smith isn't going to be making some of the connections that uh, Thiel is making. Right. So he's going to have some some views that are different. Um, after all, Islam has persecuted God's professed people. Islam has also changed the Sabbath from the seventh to the sixth day, which isn't quite true. And if one were familiar with the origins of Islam, one would know that this religion started out as a possible Christian reform movement. This religion started out as a possible Christian reform movement in response to errors already adopted by apostate Christians, but it was also perceived at that time to be yet another Christian heresy. 
Okay, what is he saying here about Islam? If one were familiar with the origins of Islam, one would know that this religion started out as a possible Christian reform movement. That's not true, is it? Well, that's pretty crazy. <laughs> I wouldn't think it'd be true. No, I, well, it's definitely not true. Uh, to say that Islam started out as a possible Christian reform movement? Okay, well, that's a new one. Okay. Think things that make you go, hmm? Huh? Yeah. The Christian world into which Islam so unexpectedly burst in the seventh century had under, had undergone a succession of divisions, controversies, and power struggles such that East and West were in, at serious odds, and each contained within its regions deep tensions and disagreements. It is a little wonder that the new religion of Islam, arising out of the heart of Arabia, appeared to those who knew of its existence as another Christian heresy not unlike the many other heresies that had wrinkled the face of Christendom since its inception. The fact that within a century after the death of the prophet Muhammad in 632, Islam had spread across much of the known world was for many Christians inexplicable, frightening, and theologically incomprehensible. Well, I'm not sure how that supports what he just said. Okay, to put forward the idea that the Ottoman Empire was the king of the north was not original to Smith. We, we know that. Nor is it consistent with the teachings of genuine futurists. Well, obviously not. Smith does not come up with a fanciful and unwarranted hermeneutic that ignores historical events by reason of its figurative and spiritualistic application. It is weird that must contrive a system of interpretation that appears plausible at first glance. But if it can be proven that Weir makes none affect the counsel of God by his tradition, by causing Ellen White to deny her own teachings, while giving the appearance of supporting her writings as Elder Daniels once did when pastoring in Fresno, California, would Weir not be giving false witness himself? The plea that Ellen White made to the church is that her writings in scripture would not be abused so as to confuse people regarding the truth. So this is really muddying the waters. One is he hasn't shown us any of this. He's made these assertions of things. For Christ's sake, do not confuse the minds of the people with human sophistry and skepticism and make of none effect the word of the Lord that the Lord would do. Do not, by your lack of spiritual discernment, make of this agency the God of God a rock of offense whereby many shall be caused to stumble and fall and be snared and be taken. So there's no way that we could apply this to what Lewis F. Weir is doing, right? I mean, this is absurd. He hasn't shown any of this. He's He's... He's made hints of things. He's made accusations, but he hasn't given any evidence. So here's what he says then further about Weir. Lewis Weir started out right in his Bible and missionary work. He was a faithful ordained minister who, in a moment of concern for, for women, he had been apparently dating before he met and married his second wife. For, for must be for a woman he had been apparently dating before he met and married his second wife was excessively and wrongly treated by certain church leaders who removed him from pastoral work without first working redemptively to correct a perceived wrong. We do not know their knowledge or motives for dealing with their brother in Christ in what appears to be a vindictive, unredemptive manner where no allowance for correction and growth and the grace of God was permitted. It is easy to understand then how Weir would attempt to vindicate James White's position on the papacy being the king of the north. Now, I have no understanding how he can connect the mistreatment of Weir by the church with him trying to vindicate James White's position on the papacy being the king of the north. Does anybody see a connection there? Why would you put it in there to start with? Why would you what? Why would you put it in there to start with? Well, I think it's part of muddying the waters. So even though he, even though Theo says, you know, it was, he was mistreated and, and he takes the position that, that Weir was mistreated. The only reason I see him putting this in here is to create doubt in the minds of the reader regarding Weir's character. But also, I don't see how it follows that if he was mistreated by the church, that it's easy to understand how then how Weir would attempt to vindicate James White's position on the papacy being the king of the north. What is the connection? Does anybody see a connection there? It, to me, it makes no sense. It, it's not logical. 
Sometimes when having been through a bitter experience, bitterness can exist in the heart, unrecognized or repressed. This may have led Weir to be overly harsh in his own criticisms of Uriah Smith's shortcomings and mistakes, and so condemning of those he deemed could not have a right understanding of righteousness by faith, so long as they held to Smith's position on the King of the North. Yet we will soon see that Ellen White strongly recommended that Daniel and the Revelation be sold as though it were a new book, that the author was led of God, and that our students should read it for the knowledge of God intended them to have. But first we need to address where Lewis Weir went wrong, so we might avoid the same pitfalls. When Ella White was alive, she wrote about how we ought to deal with those in with those in whom we see grievous defects and errors. Let us spend some time reading her counsel, apply to it what we have read so far in this critique, and resolve to live by it from now and until eternity. The reputation of a fellow labor is to be sacredly guarded. If one sees faults in another, he is not to magnify them before others and make them grievous sins. It may be errors of judgment that God will give divine grace to overcome. And if he has seen that angels, who are perfect, would have done the work for the fallen race better than men, he would have committed it to them. But instead of this, he sent and needed assistance by poor, weak, uh, earing mortals who have like infirmities as their fellow men are best prepared to help them. Ellen White wrote of her own attitude towards those who had sinned against her husband before he died, teaching us how we are to deal with each other in relationship to those who are living and dead. The last time that I had spoken there there was on the Sabbath following my husband's funeral. Um, At that time, many considered it almost presumptuous for me in my feeble condition to make the effort. But my great desire to speak words of entreaty and warning to the church led me to venture. Had those words been heeded, difficulties which have since occurred would not have been. The burden of my message was an admonition to the church to be pitiful, courteous, kind, and compassionate, to love one another as Christ had loved them. I urged them to put away their unkind thoughts toward their brethren, to cease talking of the faults and errors of others, and to search carefully their own hearts, correct their own defects of character, and purify their own souls by obedience to the truth. I entreated all to cherish a forgiving Christ-like tenderness for one another, and to guard the reputation of their brethren, remembering that the tongue is an, is an unruly member, which, if not sanctified, if not restrained, may do great injury to those whom God loves and to whom he is using in his work. Whatever may have been our course toward the dead, they are beyond the knowledge of our sorrow or repentance. Our regret for wrongs done to them can be evinced only by a reformation in our spirit and action toward the living, that none repeat the errors of the past. The spirit of Christ will lead us to think kindly of our brother. It is the work of Satan to seek some stain upon the character of Christ's followers, to talk of their faults and magnify their errors. Satan is an accuser of the brethren, and all who engage in this work show that they are actuated by the same spirit. All our prayers will be in vain while we cherish feelings of envy, jealousy, suspicion, and enmity. We shall be forgiven only as we forgive. It is no better than mocking God to engage in religious worship with hearts thinking evil and full of bitterness toward our brethren or our fellow men. Theo goes on. He says she had this counsel written to Elder Elder W.H. Littlejohn for writing of the errors of apostles, reformers, and those involved in the pioneering of the Sabbath keeping Second Advent movement and how such articles and books would affect the work God desires us to do. My respected brother, the Lord bids me to tell you that you have erred in wisdom in presenting in our church paper the articles which you have written on the danger of taking extreme views. You have not had discernment, or you would have had expressed the sentiment, you would not have expressed the sentiment that you have, or presented the subject matter of your articles in the light in which you have presented it. Our enemies will regard the examples which you have given as extreme and the sentiments uh, which you have expressed as rich morsels to feed upon, as weapons to destroy faith in the work which God is doing through his agents at this time. Let none of our brethren imagine that they are doing God's service in presenting the deficiencies of men who have gone done good, grand, acceptable work in laboring to unfold the message of mercy to fallen men for the salvation of perishing souls. Suppose that these brethren have weak traits of character, which they have inherited from their deficient ancestors. Shall these deficiencies be hunted up and made prominent? 
Chomen, whom God has chosen to carry out the Reformation against the papacy and idolatry, be represented in an objectionable light. The banner of the ruler of the synagogue of Satan was lifted high, and error apparently marched in triumph. And the reformers, through the grace given them of God, waged a successful warfare against the host of darkness. Events in the history of the reformers have been presented before me. I know that the Lord Jesus and his angels have, with intense interest, watched the battle against the power of Satan, who combined his hosts with evil men for the purpose of extinguishing the divine light, the fire of God's kingdom. They suffered for Christ's sake, scorn, derision, and the hatred of men who knew not God. They were maligned and persecuted even unto death because they would not renounce their faith. If anyone presumes to take these men in hand, to lay before the world their errors and mistakes, let him remember that he is dealing with Christ in the person of his saints. Elder Little John, you have undertaken to point out the defects of reformers and pioneers in the cause of God. No one should trace the lines which you have done. You have made public the errors and defects of the people of God, and in so doing, you have dishonored God and Jesus Christ. I would not for my right arm have given to the world that which you have written. You have not been conscious of what would be the influence of your work. Our enemies cannot controvert the truth, and therefore they are eager to catch at anything they can get by which, through their falsehoods and their perversions, they can make of no effect the truth of God in these those foreign fields where the people are unacquainted with Seventh-day Adventists. You have given them a chapter wherein uh, it will be easy for them to find that which they can magnify and distort in such a way as to create mountains out of molehills. The Lord did not call upon you to present these things to the public as a correct history of our people. Your work will make it necessary for us to put forth labor to show why these brethren took the extreme position that they did and call up the circumstances that vindicate those upon whom your articles have laid suspicion and reproach. You were not in the early experience of the people of whom you have written and who have been laid to rest from their labors. You have given but a partial view, for you have not presented the fact that the power of God worked in connection with their labors, even though they made some mistakes. And you have made prominent before the world the errors of the brethren who have not represented the, but have not represented the fact that God worked to correct those errors and to set the objectionable matters right. Opposers will be glad to multiply the matter which has been furnished to their hand by our people. And you have arrayed the errors of the early apostles, the errors of those who were precious in the eyes of the Lord in the days of Christ. In presenting the extreme positions that you have been taken by the, in the extreme positions that have been taken by the messengers of God, do you think that confidence will be inspired in the work of God for this time? Let God by inspiration trace the errors of his people for those for their instruction and admonition, but let not finite lips or pens dwell upon those features of the experience of God's people that will have a tendency to confuse and cloud the mind. Let no one call attention to the errors of those whose general work has been accepted of God. The articles you have presented are not of a character to leave the true and fair impression, to leave a true and fair impression upon the minds of those who read them concerning our work and our workers. What need was there for you to give sanction to the statements of the haters of truth and to justify them in their representations of the errors of God's people? Could you see the harm that these articles may do? You would, I should hope, have sincere repentance before God. Can it be said that Lewis Weir followed this counsel? When we as a people scatter, instead of gathering where Christ was gathered, it may well be said of us that we are insubordinate. It is not because Smith was wrong in his interpretation that the second coming of Christ was delayed. Ellen White wrote that the prophecies of Daniel's chapter 11 had nearly reached their fulfillment. She described the response of the wicked God, wicked to God's merciful grace. And she writes of how we are to work for the good of the unrepentant. Now, in anything that Lewis F. Weir writes, is he bringing up Smith's character defects and all of those types of things? Is it wrong to show where someone is wrong in their interpretation of scripture? Is that what Ellen White is saying? Can you can you see the misdirection that Theo is using here? Hopefully, I mean, hopefully it's just clear to everyone. Okay. Oh, you got some raccoons? 
Kelly. <laughs> anyway, Kelly. Post- yeah, they yeah they just they dropped, dropped by. It was pretty. It was pretty. Uh, pretty neat. <laughs> okay. God God seems to send these animals my way. A little ant, a squirrel, and they come right up and say hello. The little ant was carrying a little flower leaf, climbing up to me and encouraging me. That was about three weeks ago when I was ready to give up. Okay. It was just so neat. Anyway. Yeah. Encounters. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So, I mean, that's, so going back to our study here, uh, and we're going to come back to this on Sunday, but because um, we're going to start dealing with Ellen White statements, but can you see how we, 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 we can address what people are saying and, and explain why their interpretation is wrong without attacking their character? Do we see anything in Lewis F. Weir that's attacking Smith's character? I haven't seen it. Okay, so so this is kind of a deflection. Okay, so uh, let's close with a word of prayer. The dear Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness and love for the study. We look, pray, Lord, that um, you can be with each person, be with Kelly and the raccoons. We know, Lord, that you care for each one of us. And we pray that we can follow the counsel given in the spirit of prophecy on how we deal with those that differ with us, um, that we cannot magnifies, pe- magnify people's character defects, but that we can deal with your word honestly and openly. We ask for your care throughout this day, that you can bring us together again to study your word according to thy will. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.